to the Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 2. I want to read a couple of verses out of that Gospel, Matthew chapter 2. Certainly want to thank everyone for what has transpired thus far in worship. Surely the Spirit of the Lord is in this place. He is worthy to be praised. Matthew chapter 2, I'll read beginning at verse 11. Out of the King James, it reads, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk from this text for a few moments with this subject, this thought in mind, encountering Christ. Encountering Christ. Thank you so much, ushers. When they went into the house, they saw Mary, they saw Jesus, they fell down and they worshiped him. They opened up their treasures and presented them to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, uh, they return to their own country another way. When we encounter certain people, uh, that encounter, brothers and sisters, uh, evokes a uh, certain response within us that in turn manifests itself outwardly, whether positively or negatively. For example, when you meet a friend or loved one, that encounter evokes inner feelings of joy that are then expressed outwardly perhaps with a smile or a hug or perhaps even a kiss. When you encounter someone you deem to be your enemy, typically negative inner emotions are felt. And those emotions then express themselves again outwardly perhaps in your body language towards that person, perhaps your entire countenance, your uh, facial expressions change uh, because you find yourself in the presence of your enemy. Uh, when we encounter certain people, certain individuals, uh, it tends to evoke uh, certain emotions, uh, be they positive or negative. Uh, Maya Angelou says that people will never, will, will forget what you said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Because our encounters with one another uh, typically have uh, emotional responses tied to them. 
uh, that tend to then manifest themselves outwardly in our lives, whether positively or negatively. And the, the question for the house this morning is, what has been your response to encountering Christ? What, what, what response uh, has your life demonstrated uh, since you came in contact uh, with Jesus? Uh, this, my brothers and sisters, is life's most pressing and most significant question. Because uh, your response to your encounters with Christ uh, shapes your life in its present sense as well as your eternal future sense. Uh, when you encounter Jesus, what internal response does that evoke in your life? All right, all right. And, and, and as important, how does your encounter with Christ then manifest itself outwardly in your life? Because, my brothers and sisters, if you've encountered him, if Jesus has truly touched your life, then there ought to be something truly different about your life. Uh, there should be some distinct difference about your internal constitution as well as your external conduct. Uh, Rufus McDaniel puts it this way. He says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought. You got it since Jesus came into my heart. I now have light for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy, oh my soul, just like the sea billows roll. Why? Because Jesus has come into my heart. And the question is, what type of internal response has happened in your life since you've encountered Christ. And as importantly, how has it then manifested itself outwardly in your life? As Matthew pins his gospel, provides us his account of Jesus' life as the Messiah and the eternal king. He provides for us uh, the world's three responses to encountering Christ. You'll see uh, in this narrative in chapter two that uh, two of those responses are negative and thus should be rejected in your life. One of the responses that we'll investigate is positive, and thusly it should be mimicked and modeled in your life all right, all right. and in the life of every true born-again believer. When we consider this narrative, we see where Herod, he uh, hears about Jesus as these wise men enter into Jerusalem and they begin to ask all of the townspeople, uh, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And as Herod uh, gets wind of their inquiry, uh, the Bible says that 
he becomes troubled because of their question. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That, that, that question uh, reverberated through his mind and agitated King Herod, uh, shook him up from the core. He, he was disturbed mentally at the question, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And, and we see in him one of the world's responses to encountering Christ. That for some people, when they encounter even the name Jesus, their soul becomes troubled. Their, their, their soul gets agitated and shaken up and disturbed because Jesus threatens their current way of life. You, you, you see, when... You think you're the king, and the real king comes along. When the rightful king shows up, that troubles your heart, that troubles your mind. Because you know you have no business sitting on the throne. So when the real king shows up, it troubles your heart, and it, it troubles your spirit. Jesus, he is the rightful king. But when you think that you're the king of your own life and you've determined that you're going to live life your own way, even the mention of his name troubles your spirit. You get around folk who talking about Jesus. You run the other way. Folk knock on your door and you, you know they're going to ask you to come to church and you, you don't even get up out of bed because you don't want to be bothered. You know that there's another king that's supposed to be sitting on the throne of your life, but you've determined that you're going to live life your own way. So even his name troubles your spirit, shakes you up. Because in your heart, you know and you understand there can only be one true king. And my brothers and sisters, hear me well. Either Jesus is Savior and Lord in your life, or he's not Savior at all in your life. We need to hear that this morning. That, that you don't get to choose the extent at which Jesus controls your life. Either he's both Savior and Lord. Or he's not Savior at all in your life. You don't get half of Jesus. You get all or you get nothing. And, and, and that's why uh, the name Jesus troubles some folk because they don't have a problem with him being savior. They don't have a problem with him being deliverer. They don't have a problem with him being liberator. But when it comes to him being law, Don't, 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 don't mention that name. Don't, don't tell me that I'm supposed to live holy. Don't tell me that I'm supposed to come away from sin. I want Jesus as Savior, but I don't need him to be my Lord. And, 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 and because... Uh, because you've determined that you're not going to abdicate the throne in your own life, just the mention of his name because you know he's the rightful king. You know he's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. So just the mention of his name troubles your very spirit. That's one of the responses to encountering Christ. But, but, but when you look at the conduct 
of the chief priests and the scribes, we see another response. We see the response of indifference. For them, whatever Herod was about concerning Jesus, whatever the wise men were about concerning Jesus, they estimated in their own minds that it had absolutely nothing to do with them. And so this news of, of this king who has been born king of the Jews, it, it, it had no impact on their lives, no bearing on their lives, so they thought. Therefore, their response was one of indifference. Oh, they knew the scripture. That they understood that the true ruler of Israel would come out of Bethlehem in order that prophecy might be fulfilled. They were happy to share that truth with Herod intellectually. But that truth had no effects in their hearts internally. And thus their response to encountering the name Jesus was one of indifference. When that very truth that there has now been born one who is king of the Jews, that news should have inspired them. But instead they were indifferent towards that news. They were happy uh, to share the intellectual facts about where he was to be born geographically. They were happy to share those facts with King Herod. But it really had no sustaining impact in their lives. And isn't it interesting that you can have folk who come to church Sunday after Sunday, and they respond to the good news with indifference. Boy, that, that, that preacher, he, he sure did preach today. He, he was talking about them folk over there. Oh, I, I, I know they got straight today. As if this word has nothing to do with you. You, 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 you. you came in the church a hellion and leave out the exact same way. Because his name has been met with indifference in your life. Oh, you, 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 you know about Jesus intellectually uh, because Big Mama told you that he's a way maker. Uh, Big Mama told you uh, that he's a company keeper. Big Mama told you that he's a healer, but you don't know it in your own life. You, you, you just trying to live on borrowed testimonies. But, but you've got to get to know him for yourself. The Bible says that you must be born again. You, you, you've got to get to know him for yourself. So in the life of these chief priests and scribes, we see life's second response to encountering Christ. That there's this... Uh, intellectual uh, appreciation of who Jesus is. I know where he was born. I understand what the prophecy says. And I'm happy to share that intellectual news with you, Herod, since you asked. But it has no bearing, no impact on my life. That's the response of indifference. And so the question for you is, when you hear the good news yeah, yeah. that Jesus saves, 
What is your response? Is it one of intellectual appreciation without spiritual appropriation? Uh, do you understand that he suffered, bled, died for you? And thusly, your life should respond to that good news. Well, I, I don't want to keep you too long, but, but, but let's look at uh, these wise men and their response to encountering Christ. Because we see in them uh, the heart of true seekers as well as true worshipers. Uh, Luke tells us that these wise men saw Jesus' star in the east. And they came to Jerusalem uh, seeking, inquiring, looking for Jesus with one purpose in mind, that they might worship him. And we, we, we see that salvation was near them, that, that they sought Christ, King of King and Lord of Lords. And their search for him brought them to Jerusalem. Yeah. And, and they fill the town with that question. All right. All right. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? And, and Herod gets wind, gets news of this question that's troubling the city. And so he pulls together the chief priests and scribes and asks them, search the scriptures, let me know. Where is he to be born? They come, they deliver the news. And, and Herod, he, he gathers then those wise men, the scripture says, privately. And, and, and tells them, go ahead and, and, and find this Jesus that you seek. But when you locate him, uh, come and let me know. So that I can go and worship him also. And, and so we see that the wise men, uh, they then depart. And the star that shined upon them in the east, it reappears, the Bible says, and settles over the house where Jesus is. And the Bible says that when they saw the star, uh, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When, when they saw Jesus' star reappeared, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they saw Jesus' star reappear, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy you don't have to be in the house where Jesus is uh, just the revelation of his presence ought to be enough to cause you to rejoice with exceeding great joy you don't have to wait till you get to the church house you ought to be able to praise God in your house You ought to be able to thank him in your car. You ought to be able to praise him on your job. You don't have to wait till you get here on Sunday because God was good to you on Monday. He made a way for you on Tuesday. He brought you through on Wednesday. He opened doors for you Thursday. Praise him anyway. Yes, sir. They, they hadn't even got into his presence yet. And they already fired up. They already got their praise on just because they saw the star. Yeah. That, that, that was just a little star. But wait until you see the real star. What you going to do then? Don't wait until you get to church. You don't have to wait for the choir to sing. You ought to have a praise in your heart because of what the Lord has done for you. They, 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 they saw his star and they got excited at the revelation of Jesus' star. They, 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 they saw his star 
and it, it, it settled on the house where Jesus was. And, 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 and the Bible says uh, that when they came into the house, they saw Jesus. They saw Mary. And they fell down and worshiped him. <laughs> when they came into the house, that they saw Jesus, they saw Mary, they fell down and worshiped him. When they came into the house, they saw Mary, they saw Jesus, they fell down and they worshiped him. They wasn't worried about Mary. Joseph might have been in the house too. But when they saw Jesus, they fell down and they worshiped him. The reason some of you can't get happy in church is because you're looking for your Mary. You're looking for your Joseph. You're paying attention to the crowd when you ought to be paying attention to the Christ. If Jesus is in the house, if Jesus is in the building, then fall down on your knees and worship him. Stop worshiping preachers and worship the Prince of Peace. Stop worshiping the choir and worship Jesus. If Jesus is in the house, worship him. Yes. If Jesus is in the house, I don't care what Mary doing. I don't care what Joseph doing. I came to worship Christ. Yeah. 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 They, they saw Mary. J -J Joseph might have been milling around somewhere outside. Oh, but when they saw Jesus. They, they, they worshipped him. And then when they encountered Christ, it, it, it evoked three, three emotions within them that, that manifested themselves physically in their lives. First, we see that uh, it evoked a spirit of humble adoration. They fell down and worshiped him. They recognized, my brothers and sisters, that here we are, sinners in the sanctum of the sovereign. And they fell down and worshiped him. They, they recognized, here we are, pagans, in the presence of the Prince of Peace. And they fell down and worshiped him. Here we are, derelicts in the domain of the divine. You ought to fall down and worship him. Here we are, we're just castaways in the king's court. You ought to worship him. Hey. You, you, you don't deserve to be here. You, you did enough last night for him to take you out, but here you are, a castaway. Here you are, a derelict. Here you are, a sinner. You ought to fall down, worship him. When you recognize who you aren't and who Christ is, that, that ought to be enough to cause you to worship him when you understand that he's king of kings and he allows you into his presence that ought to cause you to worship him when you understand that he's lord of lords and he lets you into his presence that ought to cause you to fall down and worship him he's the fairest of 10,000 and he allows you into his presence fall down worship 
worship him. I, th I thought about this. I thought about this uh, as I thought about the fact that uh, Michelle Obama, our former first lady, she's still my first lady. <laughs> At least in the White House. Let me, let me clear that up. Let me clear that up. Let me clear that up. I got to go home, y'all. She's my first lady in the White House. The first lady in my house is that woman right over there, Vera Linnell McDonald. Say her full name so there's no mistaking. But, but, but as she's been on this book tour, it's been interesting to me to see the reaction of those who enter into her presence. You, you, you see folk gasping for breath just because she enters into their presence. There, there was this little girl, and, and, and she was so excited, just, just jumping up and down. Uh, Michelle Obama's on the other side of the desk, and, and the girl is in her presence, and, and her parent is trying to have her to get a hold of herself, but, but she understands that she's in the presence of, of greatness. She understands that she's in Michelle Obama's presence, and I'm just trying to help somebody understand this morning. When you enter into Christ's presence, uh, uh, it should not be a light thing it should not be flippant it should not be perfunctory because you have entered into the presence of royalty you have entered into the presence of the creator you have entered into the presence of the great I am and, and that ought to invoke something in your spirit that ought to put a, a clapping in your hand it ought to put a rejoicing on your lips something ought to happen something ought to happen something ought to happen when you enter Jesus' presence. They, they, they bow down in humble adoration. But then it also elicited from them sacrificial celebration. Uh, they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And brothers and sisters, you ought to appreciate the fact that worship ought to cost you something. <laughs> Jesus paid everything on Calvary in order for you and I to gain access to his presence. And so when he privileges us to come into his presence, uh, that worship ought to cost you something. You, 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 you shouldn't just uh, stumble up in here uh, with, with any kind of attitude. Uh, you, you shouldn't come before the presence of the king uh, with a trite, flippant attitude. With, 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 with a, 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 a contrary disposition as if God himself owes you a favor for showing up this morning. The, the reason you ought to praise God so profusely is because that praise has cost you something. You ought to praise God profusely because of the high price of your praise. That, 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 that there were some sleepless nights that God brought you through that helped produce your praise. There were some high mountains that only God helped you climb. It, it cost you a whole lot. It cost you some friends. It, it cost you some relationships. It may have even cost you something financially. But be, because of the great cost of my praise, I, I'm going to give God thanks. I'm going to give him glory every chance I get because he's done so much for me. He's brought me through so much. He's wiped away so many 
tears he's opened so many doors my praise has cost me a whole lot some friends have walked away from me folk have lied on me my praise has cost me so much but God has been a friend when I was friendless he's been a father to me when I was fatherless my praise has cost so much so there ought to be a a sacrificial celebration in your spirit. Your worship of God ought to cost you something. And it ought not be anything for you to give of God in a sacrificial way. When you consider all that God has done for you on Calvary. It ought not be anything for you to give God a sacrifice of your time, sacrifice of your treasure, sacrifice of your talents. Because if it had not been for Jesus, who was on your side, you, you, you would have you, you been counted out a long time ago. We see in them humble adoration. We see in them sacrificial celebration. But then last and finally, we see in these wise men personal transformation. Because uh, they were warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, but to return to their own country another way. When, when they left the house that Jesus was in, they were warned by God not to go back to their houses the same way they came up to the house, but, but, but go by a different geographical route. And, and what we have to do, brothers and sisters, is lift that verse of scripture up spiritually. When you enter into Jesus' house and you encounter his presence, it's a warning from God to you. If you leave out of his house and his presence and you return home the same way. When you encounter Jesus, when you enter into his presence, you ought to leave his house a different person spiritually than you were when you came in. You ought not be cussing folk as much when you leave as when you came in. You ought not be as hateful when you leave as when you came in. You ought not be as scandalous when you leave as when you came in. When you leave his house, you ought to leave a different way. Uh, you ought to leave uh, spiritually enlightened. Uh, you ought to leave spiritually infused. Uh, when you hear the good news uh, that Jesus saves, uh, you ought to leave a different way. When you hear the good news uh, that he's able to open blinded eyes, uh, that he's able to make the dumb to talk and the deaf to hear, you ought to leave a different way. When you hear that Jesus died one Friday out on a hill called Calvary, you ought to leave a different way when you hear that they pierced him in his side they, they hung him high and they stretched him wide you, you ought to leave a different way when you hear that they put him in a borrowed tomb and he stayed there Friday and he stayed there Saturday but early Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hand that ought to cause you to leave hey! that ought to cause you to leave a different way that ought to cause you to leave, my brothers and sisters, a different way. That ought to cause you to leave a different way. Jesus, Jesus, oh, what a wonderful child. Jesus, Jesus, so tender, meek and mild. Oh, what light and hope to all he brings. Just listen. I'm not going to wait for the angels to sing. I've got my own testimony. I've got my own shout. I've got my own praise. He's done wonderful things in my life. And when I encounter Jesus, I'm going to live a different way. When you encounter Jesus, you ought to leave a different way. And the doors of the church are open.
Perhaps there's someone here. The question still reverberates throughout the house. What is your response to Jesus? Is it one where his name troubles your spirit? Is it one of indifference? Or has Jesus touched your life, removed the calluses from your soul so that you truly seek him who's king of king, lord of lords, because you want to worship him. Give him your life this morning.